says by five, so I su suggest we get started. So uh, hello, hello everyone, and welcome to this uh, eighth uh, seminar in our uh, machine learning and physics seminar series uh, this term. That's actually the last seminar of the term, obviously. Uh, today we have the pleasure of welcoming Hou Ling Kyu. So Dr. Hou Ling Kyu is a senior research fellow at CERN. He received his bachelor degree from the Peking University in 2014, and his PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara, in 2019. He currently works with the CMS experiment at CERN on the Large Hadron Collider, and his research focuses on search for new physics and measurements of the Higgs boson properties. He is playing a key role in searches for the Higgs boson decaying to a pair of charm quarks, as you might have heard this week, but he's also uh, participating to the search for the Higgs boson pair production in the high momentum regime and other searches for supersymmetric partners for the top quark. A uh, link to these efforts, Hulin is very active in machine learning research for jet physics. He proposed a series of novel deep learning approaches for jet tagging, which substantially improved the performance and has been widely adopted across the CMS experiment, in particular also for the VHCC analysis, as you might have heard this week again. Uh, his talk today will focus on this particular topic and is uh, titled Jet Tagging in the Era of Deep Learning. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Yuling, and the first floor is yours. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, today I'll be talking uh, about some jet tagging techniques in the era of deep learning. So I think uh, probably many of you are already quite familiar, but in case you're not, I mean, we are doing uh, experiments with this large hydron collider at CERN, which actually locates between the border of Switzerland and France. So the RHC is the largest collider and also the highest energy particle accelerator in the world. And uh, basically, we try to accelerate protons to very high energy and try to make them collide um, with an energy of up to 14 TeV. So for the detection of such high energy particle-particle collisions, um, we use very complicated detector systems. So this is an example, which uh, is the experiment that I've been working on is the CMS experiment. And you see that this is a sketch of the CMS detector. And on the right, you also see the cross-sectional view of this a slice of this detector and the various components. So from the innermost is a silicon tracker that we can use to measure the trajectory of the charged particles. And after that, we have the electromagnetic calorimeters and also the hydron calorimeters to uh, absorb the particles and measure their energies. And then these are all like enclosed in the superconducting solenoid magnet, which produces a very powerful magnets, uh, magnetic field of 3.8 Tesla. And outside of the magnets, uh, we have also a muon system, which provides very good identification and also the momentum measurement of the muons. So in CMS, we actually use the so-called particle flow algorithm to reconstruct um, the full event. So the idea is that um, particle flow is able to combine information from all these detector sample systems. So then, for example, for like muons, we have uh, information from the tracking system and also from the muon system. And for like uh, charged particles, we also have information not only from the silicon tracker, but also from the uh, various calorimeters. So we can combine them to make a global event description. And at the end, we get a list of particles like electrons, muons, charged hydrons, neutral hydrons, and also photons. And we can use all these things to reconstruct the full event. So this is a display of a, actually a real event uh, that we collect at CMS. So we collect um, protons at uh, 13 TV in this case. And then here you see this is outgoing electron. But you also see here we have a collimated spray of uh, like a number of particles, which uh, experimentally we reconstruct as a jet. So jet is basically a collimated spray of particles. Um, jets are quite common at the RHC because we produce, uh, this is a hydro machine, so it produces a lot of like quarks and gluons and uh, these all uh, shower, radiates and hydronize and these do all kinds of jets. Um, but on the other hand, um, JET can also tell us a lot about the underlying event. So we use JET to, as a handle to probe the hard scattering event. And then we can use JET to search for like Higgs boson decaying into a pair of charm quarks or to search for um, power production of Higgs bosons and then both Higgs decays to a pair of bottom quarks. We also use uh, this kind of like Higgs keys to 4P final state to search for neural resonance that decays to a pair of Higgs bosons. 
And uh, this is an example of a search for new physics. In this case, supersymmetry that can lead to multiple jets and also like large missing transfers in momentum. So the key behind all these things is what we call jet tagging. So what jet tagging does is try to use the properties of all these outgoing particles in the jet and try to infer what is actually uh, produced in these high energy collisions that initiates um, this jet, this like uh, sprays of particles. So for example, we may wonder if this jet is coming from a Higgs boson or W or Z boson or a top quark, or it's just a very commonly produced uh, like light quark or gluon jets from the QC radiation. So this is what jet tagging is trying to, to tackle. And basically, as I said, jet tagging is trying to identify the origin of the jet, basically to figure out what kind of particles initiate the jet. And uh, essentially in the machine learning perspective, this is a classification task. And uh, since we have different kinds of jets, we are also dealing with different uh, kinds of jet tagging tasks. So the left is showing the so-called jet flavor tagging, where the goal is mainly to uh, distinguish between jets from like bottom quarks or from charm quarks or from light flavor quarks or like gluon jets. On the other hand, we can also use jets to tag, as you see on the right part, the hydronic decay of tau leptons. So, so tau is a lepton, but its hydronic decay actually also produces uh, shower of particles and uh, the jet tagging technique can also be used here. But uh, today I'm going to focus on is actually the more interesting part, which is the boosted jets. So and the boosted jet arises when, uh, for example, a massive particle like the top quark is produced with very high momentum. So then, as you can imagine, with a high Lorentz boost, all the particles become quite close to each other, and they become merged into like a single large redis jet um, instead of like being resolved into several different jets. So in the land of boosted jet tagging, we try to tag, tag like uh, top quarks, decay to um, B and W and then to three quarks, or like Higgs or W or Z to a pair of quarks. And the main background, uh, which we try to reject is just jets from a single quark or gluon, which are ubiquitously produced by QCD interactions. So um, this is the scope of boosted jet tagging, where we try to identify uh, highly Lorentz boosted heavy particles, mainly the Higgs, WZ bosons, and also the top quarks, and to reject the QCD background. And uh, for this task, there are actually some quite unique properties that we can exploit. One is that these um, basically heavy particles, they produce kind of quite characteristic signatures or substructures of the jets. So for example, for the top quark, since it decays to three quarks, you kind of get a three prong uh, distribution of the, the particles or the energies in the jet. And then for W, Z, or Higgs, it decays to a pair of quarks. So you have a two prong substructure. And then for light flavor quarks or gluons, it's more or less a, a one prong uh, substructure. Another important aspect is the flavor content. So by flavor, I mean, if there's a, a B quark or a charm quark in the, the decay. So for example, for the top quark, you always have a B quark from the decay. And uh, if you think about the Higgs, the dominant decay mode, Higgs to BB also gives uh, two bottom quarks after the decay. So with these heavy flavor quarks, um, you then have uh, B hydrons or like B mesons, they have relatively longer lifetime. And then in the detector, uh, you end up having displaced tracks and second new vertices. And also because of their larger leptonic decay branching fractions of these uh, heavy flavor hydrons, you can also get more frequently charged leptons that can also be a useful handle for identifying these uh, flavor content. So um, the goal of boosted jet tagging here is that we want to simultaneously exploit both the substructure and also the flavor information of the jet to maximize the performance. And actually, thanks to the rise of you know, deep learning techniques, we can actually get quite a significant improvement um, in the performance for boosted jet tagging these years. So then um, before actually getting into the machine learning part, um, I want to start with something more fundamental, which is how we can represent a jet and then use that for machine learning. So in the early days of using machine learning for jet tagging, uh, one of the approach explored is to treat a jet as an image 
So in this case, just a 2D um, regular image in like, like the E10 file space. And you have uh, various pixels, which correspond to um, like the intensity of the pixel correspond to the energy deposition in that particular position. So um, this, this approach actually works pretty well because then we can link this to a computer vision task, then use a very powerful convolutional neural networks to perform the tagging. But uh, as you realize from this image, it looks quite different from the regular image we get every day. And uh, one, because this is really very sparse, you probably have less than 1% pixels being activated in this jet image. And also in real detectors like CMS or FS, we also have uh, inhomogeneous geometry, meaning that it's not so trivial to um, convert a, a jet into actual um, like regular grays of uh, pixels. So then uh, another approach that uh, draws some analogy from natural language processing is to treat a jet as a sequence. So basically each particle in a the jet then becomes a character or a word in a sentence. And then we can use like recurrent neural networks or uh, one dimensional CNNs to uh, process the particles in the jet and perform the jet tagging. So one notable example in this aspect is the CMS DeepAQ8 algorithm. So it's a pretty advanced deep learning based algorithm for boosted jet tagging. And uh, the AK8 here refers to the type of jets that we use in CMS. So it's clusters with the MTKP algorithm and with the distance parameter of uh, R equals 0.8. And the idea here is that uh, we try to build a multi-class classifier. So with one algorithm, we can do both uh, like top clock tagging and also do like WZ or Higgs boson tagging. And in fact, if you see this table, we also have subdivided categories. So for Higgs, we further divide into like Higgs to BB, Higgs to CC, et cetera. So with this approach, we can actually aggregate um, the output scores and treat them like probabilities and uh, convert them. So at the end, we get a very versatile tagger that can do many, many things. So deep AK8 features the direct use of jet constituents. That means the particles in CMS are constructed as particle candidates. And also the secondary vertices that are within the jet cone, uh, which target more the, like the displacement of the BN, um, like the charm hydrons. And then in the network architecture, we basically use two 1D CNs first to separately process the particle inputs and also the secondary vertices inputs. And then we combine these 1D CNs with the fully connected network. This gives us the final prediction and classifies into various subcategories. So this slide shows the performance of the AK8 in terms of the raw curve. So on the left is for top clock tagging. So in this case, the signal and X axis is basically the efficiency to correct identify the top quark. And then on the Y axis, the background efficiency, or you can also think of as the probability of misidentifying a jet, like a QC jet um, as a top quark. And the basic idea is that uh, for fixed background, like misidentification rate, we want to get uh, as high or signal efficiency as possible. So this means that uh, going into the, like the bottom right direction is the direction of improvement. So if you compare uh, like various of these uh, algorithms, basically DeepAK8 achieves the best performance among all these algorithms. And if you compare with traditional approaches based on like uh, groomed mass and, and subjectness, you get uh, for the same signal efficiency, uh, more than an order of magnitude reduction in the background misidentification rate. And similarly, on the right shows the performance for Higgs to BB, and Deep AK8 also achieves pretty significant improvement. So, of course, this is quite successful, but uh, if you think a bit deeper about the sequence based representation of a jet, uh, you realize there's some limitation of this, this approach. So, basically, we know that a jet, uh, I mean, the particles within a, within a jet kind of has this uh, permutation invariance. So this means that uh, the tagging, uh, like the tagger response uh, of the tagger algorithm shouldn't really depend on whether you process the jet's uh, constituent particles like in this order from one to three or in a different order like uh, from one to three like this. This is because uh, regardless of how you reorder these particles, it's still the same jet. And this makes it quite different from the typical natural language um, because in a sentence or in a paragraph, um, the order of the words indeed makes quite a difference. 
So this means that if we use the sequence-based approach, we have to impose an arbitrary order, like either by the PT or like distance or some other metrics. And this uh, potentially could limit the um, performance of the machine learning algorithm. And then if you try to think uh, beyond um, this ordered sequence, then a very um, natural sort of uh, analogy that is used in the 3D computer vision uh, community is this point cloud representation of a jet. So basically here, um, the point cloud refers to an unordered set of points in space. And uh, this point cloud is typically produced by a leader or like a 3D scanner, as you can uh, sometimes find in self-driving car. And uh, the idea is that also these points, this like large number of points are unordered in the set, but the spatial distribution of these points actually carries a very important information, which is that they encode the geometric structures of the objects. So we can use these discrete points to infer whether this object is a car or a cyclist or a pedestrian. And uh, this can be used to guide a um, self-driving car. So with a very similar uh, approach, we can also think of a jet as a cloud of particles. So this means that a jet is a set of uh, particles in space and a bit different in this case, we put a jet in uh, like our more familiar 2D eta phi space instead of the 3D Euclidean space. And then the coordinates is basically the flying direction of these particles, but also we have more information measured by our detectors, like the energy, the momentum, and also like uh, for charged particles, we have the trajectory and also the impact parameters, displacement and various properties. But uh, I think the common feature between the point cloud and particle cloud is that they are both uh, permutation invariant with respect to the points and also with respect to the particles. So based on this representation, we propose particle net, which is to perform jet tagging while this particle cloud representation. And as I said, here we try to treat the jet as an unordered set of particles that are distributed in the eta phi space. And then we use a graph neural network architecture that is adapted from the dynamic graph CN. So that here is sort of illustrated in this sketch. Basically, this is uh, our starting point is the particle cloud. And then we treat each particle as a node of a graph. And then we start to connect each particle to its like, nearest neighbors in this case. And uh, this forms the edges of this graph. Once we have the edges, we can start to propagate information from the, the neighbor to the center. And this is using this kind of uh, parameterized edge function. And then once we have the edge functions to get the edge features, we can then aggregate all these edge features back to the center point. And here we try uh, to do it in a symmetric way. So you're just taking the mean. And then we repeat this information propagation and uh, also the information aggregation uh, for all the particles in the particle cloud. And this essentially gives us uh, a sort of transformation from the input particle cloud to the output, like a learned particle cloud. And then we can stack this a few layers with this kind of, kind of edge comp, uh, operation. And this builds a deep architecture so we can get not only the, the very close nearby particles, but also like more um, further um, information from like uh, its second degree or like third degree neighbors. And essentially we get uh, the correlation between the particles and also like more global information. And this helps to improve the performance of jet tagging. So here, this table summarizes the performance of particle nets. As you can see, uh, also the AUC and the accuracy comes up quite similar between these algorithms. But what is typically more meaningful for like real experimental application is the background rejection or the inverse of the background efficiency at a fixed signal efficiency. And here you see that particle net achieves a pretty significant uh, improvement if you compare to the AK8 architecture. This improvement is more than a factor of two. And uh, with the best other approach with this ResNet, you also get about uh, more than 50% improvement. So it's a quite powerful architecture and we do want to use it in actual experiments like in CMS. But uh, before that, we actually have some practical aspects to take care of. So one of the feature with these powerful deep learning packers is the correlation with the jet mass. And this is illustrated in these two uh, sketches. Basically what you get, if you train such neural network tagger um, without any special consideration is that you get this kind of mass scalping behavior on the, here is showing the mass distribution for the background QC jets. 
And basically, without any selection, you have a falling spectrum for the QC jazz. But if you apply like a tighter and tighter selection with the tiger, you start to create a peak. And uh, this becomes quite similar as the signal. So, but this is not necessarily a problem, but uh, in many cases, uh, we want to avoid this behavior because either we want to use the mass distribution to further separate our signal and background, or, I mean, if we have a mass independent tagger, we can also use it to tag a signal jazz with an unknown mass that could possibly come from new basic scenarios. So then, I mean, what we try to do is to um, perform some mass decorrelation and uh, here, I'm actually going to talk about two approaches. So one is the more traditional approach that was used by the DPK algorithm. So here is based on the so-called adversal training. And the idea here is that this part is basically the nominal DPK tagger, and uh, it consists of a feature extractor, which is the 1D CNNs. And then we use a fully connected network um, to classify the jets uh, for the final output. Um, but then, I mean, on top of that, for the mass decorrelation, we also add the mass predictor. So this part actually takes the features extracted by the 1D CNNs and use that to try to predict the mass of the jet. So the idea here is that, uh, I mean, the better we can predict the mass from the features extracted by the 1D CNNs, this means that these features are more correlated with the jet mass. And then we can actually use the accuracy of this mass prediction, so as a penalty, and we add this to um, the previous like classification loss, but with a minus sign and also with a weight factor. And then if we use the strength loss function to uh, do back propagation and to optimize the network, we can achieve both uh, uh, high like classification accuracy and also uh, to minimize the correlation of the features with the jet mass. So as you can see, this more or less works. Um, you don't really see a, a striking peak after selections with the taggers, but you do see there's still some residual scalping that is around the, the Higgs mass that we try to tag in this case. And then uh, for the particle net tagger, so we try to develop a new approach for the mass decorrelation. And uh, this is actually quite straightforward if you go back and try to think why we have mass decorrelation from the very beginning. Uh, why we have mass scalping from the very beginning. So this is because um, the training uh, has um, for the signal a fixed mass. So basically the signal jet mass distribution has a quite sharp peak. And for the background QCD jets, uh, we have like a falling uh, smooth spectrum. And then if the training uh, just sees these two, uh, I mean, if you start to exploit this kind of very striking difference between the uh, mass distributions of the signal and background, and also we don't give directly the mass, uh, it can still infer uh, this kind of information from other features that we gave it. And then this means that uh, if we want to avoid uh, this mass scalping, then what we can do is to make the signal and the background have the same mass distribution in the training. And so basically to achieve this, we produce a special signal sample that covers the full mass range. And then we can rebate both signal and background to have a flat mass as distribution, and then in the training, the network sees the same distribution for signal and background, and there's nothing to be exploited uh, purely from the jet mass. So as you see, uh, this approach works quite well, and uh, basically we get an even smoother mass distribution for the background jets compared to this uh, adversarial training approach. And then we, um, so if we try to compare the performance with these two different mass decorrelation approaches, what you see is that uh, for this particle net uh, mass decorrelation using the flat mass signal sample, you actually lose very little. So basically this is comparing the um, solid pink line versus the dashed uh, orange line, which is a bit difficult to see because it overlaps with another line. Uh, but you see in the bottom line here is that uh, there's very minimum performance gap between uh, after the mass decorrelation. On the other hand, for the previous uh, mass decorrelation approach using adversal training, you see there's a quite uh, large gap. Basically, the mass decorrelated one shown in the dashed green curve uh, lose quite a bit performance compared to the nominal tagger. So with this approach, uh, we can actually uh, further uh, like improve the mass decorrelated particle net tagger uh, performance, and uh, we use that in several analyses. So now that we have a very good mass decorrelated tagger, so a natural um, question or natural task we 
come up in our mind is to see if we can further improve the reconstruction of the jet mass itself. So this is because the jet mass is also one of the most powerful observables for twisted jet tagging. And as you see here, uh, this is showing the comparison of the soft drop room jet mass for um, the QCD diagram and also for the WZ and the Higgs bosons. And you see that for the signal, uh, these give very sharp mass sticks, while for the background, there's a, a pretty smoothly falling spectrum. So this gives us pretty good separation between the signal and background. And uh, of course, we want to further improve the uh, mass resolution to have an even sharper peak. And then um, the idea here is that we try to develop a mass regression algorithm. So we basically use deep learning to see if we can reconstruct the jet mass with the highest possible resolution. And uh, for the technical setup, we use a very similar setup as the particle net tagger. But instead of doing a classification task here, we try to use the jet constitution inputs to directly predict the jet mass. So for the regression targets, uh, we set it uh, for the signal jazz to be the generated particle mass of this X particle. And X can decay to BB bar, CC bar, or QQ bar. And note that this X actually has a black spectrum in this range. And for the background QC jazz, uh, we basically use the soft drop mass of the generator level, uh, so particle level jazz. And uh, then uh, we feed these into a log cost loss function, which is illustrated in um, this green curve. And uh, in the small value region, it behaves like uh, MSE loss. And in the large value, it behaves like MAE loss. And this gives us a more uh, smooth behavior um, to have uh, to be like more robust to the tails of the, the mass distributions. So here is how the mass regression works. So on the left, you see the mass response for a signal jet, in this case, Higgs to CC. And the x axis is showing the mass response. So the reconstructed jet mass divided by the target mass. And the green solid curve is showing the regression behavior. And you see that not only it gives much sharper signal peak, but it also gets rid of the, some tails at low values and also at high values, which were previously seen with the soft drop uh, grooming algorithm. On the right is showing the mass distribution for the background QC jazz. And uh, the key here is that we try to apply some like type selections on the particle net tagger. And we want to make sure there's no uh, mass scalping from this regression. As you do see, there's actually very little change in the background jet mass distribution after selections with various uh, tagging working points. So basically with this mass regression, we can get uh, about uh, 20 to even 25% improvement in the final sensitivities for analysis involving HIS2BV or HIS2CC decays. And now with these powerful techniques, we can uh, try to apply them to real analysis and see what we get. So here I'm going to introduce a few, actually two examples. One is the recent CMS search for um, Higgs boson digging to pair of charm quarks, so the Higgs2CC. So uh, as you see that so far we have established the Higgs coupling to the vector bosons, W and Z, and also the third generation formions, top and bottom quarks, and also the tau leptons. And more recently, we're starting to get like some first evidence for Higgs to muon coupling. So of course, the next milestone would be the Higgs coupling to the second generation quarks. And uh, of course, the first of uh, this target would be to probe the Higgs coupling to the charm quark. So however, the search for the Higgs to CC is very challenging at ARC because firstly, uh, for the standard model scenario, the branching fraction of Higgs to CC is quite small. It's just 3%. And uh, to, to put it in context, this is only one over 20 compared to the dominant Higgs decay mode, Higgs to BB. Nevertheless, since LHC is a hydron collider, so we face enormous backgrounds uh, that are arising from you know, light flavor quarks or gluon jazz or like uh, even bottom jazz. And so in this sense, um, the identification of the charm quarks is actually the key and the most difficult part of this analysis. So for the CMS analysis of the Higgs to CC, we target associate production of the Higgs boson with the W or Z boson, and then the Z or W decays to leptons. So this gives us handles to trigger the event also to help reduce the otherwise enormous QC background. And to fully cover different Higgs CK topologies, we basically have two approaches. So one is the resolved jet approach that try to reconstruct the two charm quarks separately. And the other is the more jet topology where we try to target um, both charm quarks with a single large radius jet. 
And uh, this is actually uh, what that really benefits from all these boosted jet, jet tagging techniques that I just uh, talked about. So just to put it into context, uh, this is uh, on the left, it's showing the performance for the particle net XQCC tagger. And as you see that uh, compared to the previous tagger, uh, which is the DeepAK8 or DeepAK15 shown in the blue curves, um, the new particle net tagger in the red curves actually for the same signal efficiency can um, improve the background rejection for about the factor of five for both the VPS jets, which is our main background, and also for the Higgs 2BB, which is a very difficult and a largely irreducible background. So it's a simple calculation. This alone already gives more than a factor of two improvement in the final sensitivity for this x 2 cc search. And on the right is, uh, we also use this mass regression and uh, we get about a factor of 50, 50% uh, improvement in the mass resolution. And this gives us more than 20% improvement in the final sensitivity. So powered with these very advanced uh, boosted jet tagging techniques and also combined with the resolved jet topologies, um, the CMS search for VHH2CC uh, with the full rental data set gives us a pretty stringent constraint on the Higgs2CC. So we actually get the upper limit of 14 times the standard model for this process. And the expected one is 7.6. And if you compare with the ATAS full run to results, so using the same data set and the very similar search, um, the expected result is about uh, more than factor four better. And also this is uh, actually getting uh, quite close to the expected sensitivity previously uh, projected for the high Lumi RHC with 3,000 investment of data. So that is about uh, like 20 times more data. And uh, the expectation there is uh, upper limit of 6.4 times the standard model. And with a much smaller data set, we already reach a factor of uh, like 7.6 times the standard model. So the right plot summarizes the upper limits from different channels and uh, uh, also from different um, like leptonic channels. And what you see here is that basically the more jet topology, which is uh, using these advanced uh, boosted jet tagging techniques is essentially driving the sensitivity so it alone gives an upper limit of about 8.8, .8, while the combined is uh, just 7.6. And also as a side product of this uh, Higgs 2 cc search, um, so since we perform the validation of the full analysis procedure by measuring a similar process, the C2CC decay in VZ production, and uh, we measure this uh, process to be very consistent with the standard model expectation with about 20% uncertainty. And this also leads to the first observation of uh, the C2CC decay at the hydron collider with a significance of 5.7 sigma. So here you see the mass distribution of this large radius jet uh, in the merger topology. And after the background sub subtraction, you see a clearly uh, Z-peak near 90 GV. And those on top of that, some uh, like access from the XCC events. Okay, so another search that is also powered by these powerful uh, boosted jet tagging techniques is the search for Higgs boson power production. So this is another high importance uh, topic at the RHC, but also the future high Lumi RHC, because this would allow us to probe this uh, like Higgs potential term in the standard model. And uh, needless to see, this dye Higgs production is a very rare process in standard model. So the dominant production mechanism is our gluon fusion, which uh, uh, mainly comes from these diagrams. And this actually gives us uh, direct access to this trilinear Higgs coupling, which is uh, critical to pro probe the Higgs boson self-coupling. And the subdominant production mode is our vector boson fusion. So the Higgs boson is uh, produced, uh, this Higgs boson pair is produced uh, like by uh, vector bosons radiated from the initial state quarks. So this approach actually has a pretty unique uh, sensitivity to this VVHS quartic coupling. And uh, a more um, like striking fact is that uh, if this coupling, this VVHS coupling deviates from the standard model value, meaning that this coupling uh, modifier uh, is away from one, then the events uh, will start to become more and more boosted. And this also gives us a pretty uh, special advantage use this uh, more jet approach and uh, to use this boosted jet editing techniques. So then, I mean, we performed the search targeting the VBF production of this six boson pair. And uh, then basically the event selection is sort of 
illustrated in this one diagram. So in the central region, we try to look for two high PT Higgs bosons, both to decay to a pair of uh, bottom quarks. And then uh, for the VBF topology, we also asked for two additional gens that are have a high pseudo rapidity gap and also have large uh, invariant mass that are compatible with the VBF topology. So with this, uh, we also use uh, like the particle net tagger to identify the Higgs BB decays and also the particle net uh, mass regression for the mass rec reconstruction. So with this approach, this set a uh, pretty stringent limit on this VVHH quartic coupling, which is summarized in this bottom left plot. And basically we constrain this kappa 2V coupling to be between 0 0.6 and uh, 1.4. So one is the, the standard model value. And also uh, this means that for the first time we actually exclude um, kappa to be equal to zero, uh, actually with a significance much higher than five sigma. And this indirectly proves this VV HH coupling uh, do exist if we of course assume the other Higgs couplings are at the standard model values. And again, if we compare with the Aftas approach, this also leads to a pretty uh, like a strong improvement uh, compared to the Aftas search. Okay, so then uh, I'm going to talk about some new uh, like developments in the jet tagging and uh, trying various approach uh, to improve jet tagging performance further with deep learning. And uh, basically the focus here is try to really to incorporate more physics knowledge and try to incorporate domain specific uh, like uh, inductive bias to help um, the deep learning algorithms. So I first start with our loon net, which uh, is based on this loon jet uh, plane representation of a jet. So the idea here is that uh, um, basically um, the loon jet plane can be used to represent the radiation uh, like within a jet. And the idea here is that if we have a jet and we have like uh, emissions or splittings, we can represent these uh, emissions or splittings in a, in a loon plane. So in this case, if this uh, splitting is from like the primary um, uh, primary emission, then they are both like represented in the primary loon jet plane. And then if we have a splitting from uh, like a secondary particle, then um, this splitting is further represented in the secondary uh, loon jet plane. So um, basically, as you can see, this uh, loon jet plane can provide a very efficient description of the, the full radiation patterns uh, within a jet. And the moreover, uh, it has another advantage being that uh, different kinds of uh, kinematic regimes are well separated in the loon jet plane. So for example, the lamp particle regime is characterized by uh, smaller KT values. Well, the large um, angle um, regime is mostly coming from SR, and you also have like a uh, large G, which correspond to the hard collinear um, splitting, et cetera. So this not only, I mean, provides a, a way to like represent um, the radiation patterns within the jet, but it also gives us additional handles to, to control actually what kind of information we want to use for jet tagging. So with this representation, uh, we tried to develop the loon, jet, loon net, which is a graph neural network architecture based on the loon jet plane. And technically, we actually use um, this loon tree, which is basically a binary tree uh, built on the Cambridge Arkham clustering of the jet. And essentially, I mean, this loon tree is fully equivalent to a full uh, loon jet plane. And from this tree, um, we basically convert it to a graph and uh, each node then corresponds to emission or a splitting. And then uh, basically associate with each splitting, we can define a set of kinematic variables um, that uh, describe the, the kinematic information of this current splitting. So for example, we can have the, the tatar um, between the splittings, the KT, and the amount mass, and also like the momentum ratio and uh, um, et cetera. So with this, we can uh, input this uh, loom tree into a graph neural network. And uh, overall, the network architecture is quite similar to particle net, but uh, the main difference being here that uh, the graph architecture is fully specified by the loom tree. And so we don't need to do any like uh, k-nearest neighbor finding as we do in the particle net. And also a big difference is that uh, here, since it is a binary tree for each particle, it has only up to like three neighbors. While in particle net, uh, each particle actually connects to either like seven or like uh, 16 particles. 
So um, basically, we studied two variants of the low nets, and uh, they have the same network architecture. And the main difference is the uh, like input features that we use for this network. So in one case, we use um, the full like five-dimensional inputs, and in the other case, we use only uh, three-dimensional inputs, the KT, the delta, and also the um, Z, which is the momentum ratio. So here, I mean, we try to look at the performance of the net. So on the left, you see a rock curve for top tagging. And basically what you see is that uh, with the three dimensional input, LUNET 3 already gets a pretty comparable performance compared to particle net. And with the full five dimensional LUNET, you get a significant improvement in the top tagging performance. And another advantage is that if you compare the computational cost, you realize that uh, LUNET can lower the, like the training time or the inference time by almost an order of magnitude. This is because we get rid of the, like, the dynamic graph architecture and also the expensive uh, like k-nearest neighbors. And uh, another, I would say, more important advantage of LoonNet is that it provides a systematic way to control the robustness of the tagger. So this is shown here, which uh, like illustrates the robustness uh, versus performance. So on x-axis, um, this is the direction that gives like uh, more resilience versus number of effects. And on y-axis, the higher is like better performance. And the idea here is that by applying, you know, increasing KP cuts, we can get rid of the like the number of region, which is characterized by small KT for the splittings. And then we can substantially improve the robustness of the stagger uh, versus number of effects. Okay, another approach that we uh, recently explored is to add Lorentz symmetry to the graph neural network. So this leads to the Lorentz net, um, which uh, you see the network architecture on the right, and also a description of this uh, graph, like uh, message passing process on the left. So basically for this graph neural network, we actually give it two kinds of inputs. Um, one is the coordinate inputs, which is uh, the input like four vector of all the particles. And then we also have uh, like feature inputs here to preserve the symmetry, we actually only consider the scalar inputs um, for the nodes. And then from these two inputs, we start to build um, the message that we try to propagate along the graph. And uh, we want the message to be also Lorentz invariant. So then what we use as inputs are the two scalar um, like inputs from the, the center and neighbor. And also uh, we define actually two um, pairwise Lorentz invariants views based on like the um, um, Minkowski norm and also the Minkowski uh, like inner product, uh, which are fully Lorentz invariants. And from that, uh, basically, since other inputs are Lorentz invariant, the message also Lorentz invariant, and we can use that to update the coordinates and also update the feature, and then the full um, like um, building block of this uh, graph net is fully Lorentz group equivalent. And uh, this approach actually gives quite good performance. Um, on the left, this is showing the performance on the top tagging benchmark data set, and you see that uh, with this Lorentz net it uh, improves uh, quite substantially over the particle net, uh, I think by going from like uh, 1600 for the background rejection to more than uh, 2000. And then if you consider model complexity, so Lorentz net, since it explicitly used the Lorentz symmetry, it actually achieved this high performance with fewer number of parameters compared to um, the particle net. Uh, also, it uh, still, uh, like has a bit higher computational cost. This is mainly because it uses a fully connected graph while particle net uh, uses only like k nearest neighbors. So this is probably something uh, that could further improve in the future. And another advantage that comes with this uh, symmetry preservation is that, uh, so if you look at the left plot, if we try to boost um, like the whole uh, jets or the particles in the jet, along say the x direction or an upward direction. And you see that uh, this Lorentz like uh, net shows a very stable performance uh, after various Lorentz boost, while the other architectures that are not uh, Lorentz invariant start to degrade substantially as the Lorentz boost increase. And another advantage of uh, incorporating symmetry is that we can now achieve much higher sample efficiency. So this means that we can achieve a pretty good performance by training over very small 
uh, data set. In this case, we are using like 0.5%, which is roughly just 6,000 jets. And it reaches already a comparable performance uh, when if you train it uh, with particle net, we need like an order of magnitude larger data set. So in this case, uh, incorporating the symmetry also gives us uh, like a more sample efficient uh, algorithm. Okay, so then the last thing I would like to touch a bit on is the particle transformer. So this is motivated by the recent like uh, rise of using these self-attention and also these transforming architectures, not only in like, in, like uh, language models, but also in computer vision and even in like uh, more like scientific related uh, tasks like alpha photos also using attention mechanisms. So what we're trying to explore here is that if we can benefit uh, the kind of universal architecture of a transformer and to try to improve the jet packing performance. So what we realized from this study is that uh, the pure uh, plane transformer architecture is actually not that efficient, not, not, not that uh, enough to improve the performance. And what we have to do is to introduce some um, tailored like uh, uh, features um, that are helpful for jet tagging. So this is the basically the interaction term that we put into this transformer. And the idea here is that uh, we add these like kinematic uh, features that are also used in like uh, loon nets. And then we use an embedding to transform these things. And then we inject all these um, into the, um, the self-attention like just as a pairwise uh, feature before the softmax. And with this approach, uh, we also kind of need a very large data set because um, so far we have tried on small data sets and doesn't really fully reveal the performance of this transform architecture. So to tackle that challenge, we also prepared a large scale data set that we also intend to make public. So this data set actually consists of uh, 10 classes of uh, different jets that covers uh, like x 2 vb x 2 cc most of the top decays, but also some like new uh, scenarios like Higgs to Lugu and the Higgs to WW to four quarks, and also like a Higgs to WW to El Nio QQ, et cetera. So it's this very large data set uh, that is uh, like more than uh, almost two others magnitude larger than existing data sets. So we try to uh, test our new architecture on this data set, and uh, the performance is like this. So as you read from this table, um, this new architecture um, trained on this very large data set do give a significant performance improvement. For example, for like Higgs VB, we get about 30% improvement in the background rejection. And uh, for the Higgs CC, I think we get uh, something like 70% improvement. And in also some cases we do get like uh, more than, you know, a factor of three or for example, for the top quark in this case. And uh, so and these are quite, quite impressive results. And another thing is that uh, here also shows the performance of the transformer without this addition of the interaction term. And you see that uh, its performance also still better than particle net in some cases. Uh, it doesn't really outperform particle net uh, that much. And also if you look at the model complexity, uh, we see that also this transformer architecture has much more um, parameters. Uh, in terms of the computation, it doesn't really add that much. So at the end, um, the inference and also the training time are still quite comparable. And another sort of uh, nice thing introduced by this large scale data set and also these like transform architectures that uh, this now allows us to use a new training paradigm. So um, the idea here is that we can actually perform a supervised pre-training on this very large jet class data set. And then we can do a fine tuning uh, to tailor it to the downstream tasks. So these are the results we get for um, this approach. So on the left is the pre-training on the jet class and the fine tuning to top tagging benchmark data set. And on the right is a fine tuning to the quark long data set. And you see that basically um, this pre-trained and fine-tuned model achieves a pretty significant improvement compared to uh, just purely like uh, architectures, purely trained end-to-end uh, -end on these smaller data sets. And also here you also get um, like uh, the performance of the um, particle transformer um, like trained end-to-end -end on these smaller data sets. And as you see, uh, they don't show a significant improvement compared to uh, existing like architectures. Okay, so this brings me to my summary. So we have seen that the rise of deep learning has brought a lot of progress in jet physics. 
especially um, new approaches uh, like graphing networks and et cetera, they have significantly improved the jet tagging performance and they also lead to substantial increase in the physics reach uh, at the RHC. So towards the future, I think, I think there are two, basically two main aspects. One is to try to push further the performance, um, possibly with like new architectures, like graph networks and transformers, et cetera. But I think here the key would really be to incorporate like more domain specific knowledge and use our physics knowledge to uh, guide the, the construction of architectures. Another important direction uh, I see would be to have uh, more like large public data sets. So we intend to make public this large uh, jet class data set, but uh, we think it would also be beneficial if we could get like uh, open data from others and CMS, et cetera. So I think these large data sets uh, would also benefit the whole community quite a bit. And another, I think, interesting direction is to look at new training strategies. So, so far we have mostly performed like end-to-end -end training on specific data sets. And with larger data sets, we can start to think about supervised uh, pre-training. But uh, I think the future has, has already been like widely adopted in language models and also computer vision is to really look into unsupervised or semi-supervised pre-training. And this would open um, the, the, the error like uh, to train on real data and then to find your own specific uh, tasks that we have for uh, uh, cloud physics. So another aspect I think is equally important is to uh, increase the robustness of the algorithms and also to have the systematic uncertainties under control. So from the machine learning perspective, of course, we should investigate uh, to explore like more robust architectures and uh, different training schemes, especially those like to train on real data directly. And on the other aspects, I think we can also work together, you know, jointly from the experiment and also from the theory community to improve our Monte Carlo simulations, be it like metrics element, and also be the um, like bottom shower modeling. And lastly, we also need to really improve our calibration methods. And this is, I think, the last step, but also a crucial step um, before we can actually use all these advanced algorithms in real experimental analysis. So as a conclusion, I would say um, to really push things further, we need deep thinking uh, as physicists, but also we need deep learning, uh, like uh, with a very strong synergy with the like, developments in the com in computer you know, science community and with the machine learning community. And only with the combination of the two, we can really uh, push the performance even further. So, okay, that's all from my side. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Uh, that was very interesting talking to you. And uh, yeah, thank you for des describing so many different interesting architecture. So um, let's move on to questions. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for the speaker? Uh, yes, Rob. Yes, hi, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I have a few kind of technical questions. Um, the first one is about your this transformer architecture where you add in yes. this interaction term. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, um, so I've read other papers that use transformers where they just introduce a bias in the in the softmax, which sounds kind ah. of similar to what you're doing. Is that is this significantly different? I think it's very similar. Yeah, it's essentially it's also yeah, it's the bias term that is at uh, before softmax. Right. So, but do you so because these are not trained, right? They are directly, or is the embedding trained? Yeah, it's only the embedding. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, the other thing I was wondering about is um, how do you, so you incorporate particle flavor in, uh, for instance, in this transformer architecture as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you do, do you do that by embedding it or is there some other way of doing that? Uh, so we basically use like one hot encoding to, to encode the particle identification like PID inputs. And then uh, they are like treated together with other features, like other continuous features together in this uh, particle embedding. Right. Okay. So it just looks like the, the four vector and then append it with uh, a one hot vector. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And Philip? Yo, hello. Uh, thanks also very much from my side for this great talk. It's super impressive to see all of those various advances that you have put together. And that's also my question, which unfortunately isn't, isn't super well defined. But I was wondering if you had any sense 
you know, how close these advanced techniques are actually taking us to the absolute limit of, you know, B-tagging identification or, or flavor identification, uh -huh. given a certain data set, or maybe sort of more practical, given a certain detector. You know, how close, what are the, what, 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 in your sense, what is the main bottleneck going to look like for the years ahead? Is it going to be during the architecture? Is it going to be retaining calibratability of the result? Is it going to be something totally different? Sort of what are the you know, cornerstones that we shouldn't lose sight of? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Uh, it's also, I think it's a difficult to answer question. So I don't think, uh, I mean, we can easily see where is like the, the upper limit of the tagging performance because so far what we are trying to do is to just try to push it a bit further and see how far we can go. Uh, my feeling is that we still haven't really hit um, the wall. I think there's still some room to gain. I mean, this particle transformer, you see that uh, with large data set already improves the performance quite a bit. But this is, I mean, if you compare with like really large models used in like natural language processing in computer vision, this is like probably one, two orders of magnitude smaller in terms of number of parameters. Um, so I think, yeah, if we can really scale up to that level, uh, we can see um, what performance we get. Uh, if we don't see much improvement, then maybe that's an indication of we are hitting some limitation. But then I think uh, um, another, I would say equally and probably more importantly, like practical aspect is really to understand and to control the systematics and uh, to think of you know, ways to better calibrate these taggers because at the end, um, if you only get like 10, 20% improvement in the efficiency then, uh, but if you suffer from like 20% skill factors or like 50% uh, uncertainties, you're still not going to improve the outcome of your analysis. So I think uh, as experimental physicists, I mean, we do need to, to think about both aspects we need to push the machine learning. We also need to, um, to think about how to calibrate. And uh, also I think with our theory colleagues to think about how to improve our like uh, simulations. Because these, I think, in, I think all these combined will really benefit um, the, the actual physics rates um, using these advanced techniques. Thanks a lot, great answer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, Frederick. Um, I don't know if the others can hear you. I can't hear. You. Oh, yeah. Okay. The sun is here now. I cannot hear. You. Can, can you hear me now? Hello. Can you uh, hear now? Now, yes. Now, now yes. Mm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just saying, uh, have you looked at direct comparisons between particle transformer and Nunnet? Uh, do you have a sense of uh, like whether particle transformer can get some insights that you miss? Uh, or do you Okay, I think I missed the, the last part, but maybe let me just try to answer. So if anything, yeah, you can ask. Uh, you can follow up. Sorry, my so, Wi-Fi is not very reliable. Uh, no problem. Um, so we haven't really looked at the comparison between particle transformer with uh, some of the more recent models like uh, LoonNet or even the Lawrence Nets. Um, I think one, I would say, technical challenge to, to look at low nets is to, to figure out a way to really scale up the, the, like the training pipeline, because now it tries to load like um, everything into memory and try to use FastJet to convert things. And now with this very large like 100 million data set, uh, we have to figure out how to Technically, uh, to to break and uh, to, to to do the training pipeline. Yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for the nice talk. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you indeed. And I was thinking of actually asking a question myself. Um, so it's more connected to the HTC analysis you showed. Um, mm -hmm. You use a particle net network on that one. And I was wondering what kind of events do you use? Because you mentioned like you blur away the mass difference. But do you use generic multi jet? So, like a, a random boson, even probably an artificial one, decaying to BB, CC, and, and um, lighter leptons, or lighter quarks, sorry? Or do you also uh, actually use a 
uh, process that are simulated uh, and connected to the analysis itself, like an HCC, an HGBB, and a V plus jet. Okay, so so you're asking about the, the training samples for the for the tiger, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, like uh, I think uh, back like back graviton, so new resonance sticking to a pair of Higgs bosons, and uh, so basically we have two varying masses. One is the the resonance mass, and the other is the Higgs mass uh, that uh, ranges between fifteen to two hundred fifty GeV. And so with like varying these two parameters, we basically get uh, like pretty good coverage on both like a full PT range and also full mass range. And then uh, we can perform the, the training of these algorithms in a like mass decorrelated fashion. Okay. And um, can I ask you just more details on how do you, yes, for yes. example, mm -hmm. for, for, how do you approach for then uh, the G plus jet background? Uh, do you work on flavor inclusive? Like, um, do you defer V plus CC from V plus BB? Um, seems to be the case. I don't know. Ah, so for the so we, we don't specifically train on like V plus Jazz, but uh, since the, the training, uh, okay, so the training, yeah, for the signal is like that. For the background, we just use QC multi jet. So there it gets uh, jets of all kinds of flavors, like light quarks or also gluons, like gluons speaking to BB and CC. And then when we evaluate on the, like the, the actual backgrounds of this analysis, uh, like V plus Jazz and TT bar, um, of course. Uh, so we also need to, to calibrate them and to get like uh, correction factors for the backgrounds. So for that, we use a basic data-driven method for the background estimation. So we apply, always apply the same cut on this tagger for the signal regions and the corresponding control regions. And this ensures that in the control regions, we also have the same jet flavor composition, like V plus uh, heavy flavor composition uh, as the signal regions. And then we can use the normalization difference in the control regions and uh, to transfer that to the signal regions to estimate the, the, the V plus jet background. So that's basically what we did. Right, thank you very much, Sarah. That was great to have. Thank you. Um, yeah, does okay. anyone else in the audience have any questions for speaker? Mm, doesn't seem so. So let me thank you again for a really great talk and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, so this was the last uh, seminar of this term. So uh, we'll be back next term with a new programs that we'll be sharing on the same uh, channels. And see you then. And thank you again for your talk. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for everyone. It's a good pleasure.